Rachel's one of our best of young novelists. It was 2003, and um, she, let's see, her first novel was The Dark Room, and it was shortlisted for the Booker Prize in 2001. And um, let's see, your further novels are Field Study and Afterwards. Um, you were, oh gosh, you received so many awards. I like <laughs> <laughs> Your yeah, first award, long listed for the Orange Prize for Fiction, but I have this quote here that I really like. Um, this was for the E.M. Forster Award, um, which is given by the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Um, they wrote, Rachel Seifert voice is a quiet, subdued, and thoughtful one. It, provokes, it provides a deceptively calm cover for the subject of her books, which is often the cruelty of colonial power and of war and their bitter aftermath. In balancing the two, Seifert displays an admirable control over craft. And I think it sums up your writing really well. Um, so let's, shall we, um, she'll give us a short reading of her, of her story in the Britain as she hands across the water. Yes, it's called Hands Across the Water. It's two chapters from a novel in progress which I've um, sort of turned into a short story for the purposes of Granta. Um, the water in question that the hands are reaching across is the Irish Sea. It's set mostly in Glasgow, but starts in um, Northern Ireland, in Tyrone. And um, I will... Yes, I'll just read. <laughs> Graham was 18 and rubbish at talking to females. He looked like a grown man, only he wasn't yet. He was just all shoulders and neck, wide forehead and no talk. Everyone in the flute band was aware of this, so when they were out in the Ulster Wilds, it was him they dispatched to get the lunch, because it was a girl he'd have to speak to on the burger van fine one. He'd been up since dawn, drumming and drinking all morning. It was his first time away from home, Graham's first orange walk outside of Glasgow, but nothing like the other walks he'd been on. Same skirling flutes, dark suits, bright sashes, but no tarmac and traffic, no high flats and crowds of torn-faced shoppers. Tyrone was all wet fields and hedgerows as far as I could see, and the echo of the lambegs thudding back at them from the low hills. There were masses of folk out to, more every village they passed through, and the field they stopped in at the halfway mark was heaving. Grannies in deck chairs with tea and flasks, wee mobs of kids in rangers' t-shirts, candy floss and sausage suppers, smell of damp grass and frying onions. The lodgers were on the far side, all the doer faces making their speeches, reading out their Bible verses. The band stuck with the crowd though and the colour, more chance of a drink there. Graham hadn't paid for a pint since he got here. There were more, always more folk buying, especially if he told them his granddad was from Ireland, his mum's dad, and that Papa Robert was in the orange. Graham's tongue all loose with lager, he'd been telling folk ever since the ferry, but his tongue was pulled tight again by the sight of Lindsay. Dark red hair, wee skirt and trainers, bare arms, all those freckles. She drew all eyes in the queue, including Graham's. Lindsay was taking the money, getting the cans of juice out of the fridge and adding up what was owed in her head. Half the band had set their sights on her for after, <coughs> even, none of, if, even if none of them rated their chances, and Graham could see why when she turned her grey eyes on him. What let it be then? She knew he'd been staring, so Graham had to look past her to get the words out. He was ordering for most of the band, or that's what it felt like, and then a couple of the flutes kept changing their minds, calling across from the grass where they'd parked themselves with the drums chopping and changing between burgers and bacon rolls. They were doing it to wind him up. Graham knew that fine well, so he did his best not to let it show. Except the order got too hard to follow, and then Lindsay gave up on the sums and got the calculator out of the cash box. The queue behind Graham was grumbling by that stage, but Lindsay just told them all to watch their manners. He looked up at her then and saw how her eyes were sharp and smiling, her back straight like she could take on all comers. She got Graham to go through the old order again, roll by roll, burger by burger, and she wasn't teasing him either. She knew he was shy, but that was all right. Graham watched her fingers on the calculator buttons, her narrow lips repeating what he told her, the pink tip of her tongue and all her freckles. His eyes found them on her face and hands first and then down her neck as well and up her arms. They were all wearing the same T-shirt on the van, oversized, with what looked like a lodge number and today's date printed across the top of the chest. They had aprons on too, so the rest of the shirt was covered. But Lindsay was wearing her t-shirt back to front and knotted at the side, so when she turned round to get Graham's change, 
He could see the red hand printed on the cloth and how long her hair was too, a long loose plait. It stopped at Lindsay's hips where Graham found more freckles to stare at on a pale inch of lovely skin just above the waistband of her skirt. After all that, she didn't have enough coins left in the float. I'll bring the change over later. Lindsay told Graham she'd come and find him before the lodgers set up off the road again. Set off up the road again. And she looked at him too, making her promise. I won't forget you, honest. Graham watched her while he was eating from the safer distance of the damp grass, sitting with the rest of the band. She was the same with everyone she served, joking, familiar, and he was gutted, thinking he'd just imagined it. He'd been so sure of it up at the van that she fancied him. He tried to work out how old she was. Could be 14, could be 18, no telling. Graham hoped she wasn't older than him. Lindsay did come over when they were making ready to go, and she gave Graham the coins she owed. He had his drum back on already and his gloves, so he pulled those off to take the money. He felt her fingers touch his palm just for a second, and then she stayed next to him while the bands and lodges assembled. Graham couldn't look at her then, but he was certain again. He waited for her after the walk in the back room of the only pub. He sat there a good couple of hours, sure that she'd come, certainly he'd never have the nerve to go and look for her if she didn't, and then he saw her. Coming through the bar and looking for him, he knew she was, because when she saw him, she made a beeline through the crush. She had the same shirt on, still knotted, but no apron, so now Graham could see the skin on her belly, and it was all he could do to stop himself putting his hands there when she got up close. One drink later, they were out the back and walking, past where the barrels were stacked and on, with the sun going down behind their shoulders. It was quiet out there, after the pub doors fell shut, just the two of them on the empty track, and neither of them talking. Only the sound of the wind in the wheat, and the weeds growing tall beside the farm gate. They walked the length of a tumble-down wall until it got low enough to climb, and behind that was a hidden spot with just enough grass for Lindsay to lie down. Graham shouted out when he pushed himself inside her. He didn't mean to, but it didn't matter. She didn't laugh or anything. But then after, when it was over, when she stood up and pulled down her skirt, Lindsay looked at him, and he saw it hadn't been that way, not for her. Graham was still on his knees and busied himself with his trousers, tucking in his shirt to cover his shame, gutted again. Too much drunk, he regretted the pints he'd already sunk. Lindsay stood a moment watching, and then she crouched down next to him, reaching for her knickers. They'd slipped off over her ankles, over her trainers, and she picked them up from where they'd landed. Where are you from, then? She was looking at him, face level with his and close, knickers bunched in her fist. Graham told her, Scotland, and she rolled her eyes, but friendly, he thought, like she'd been on the burger van that afternoon. Graham said, from Glasgow, from Drum, Drum Chapel. He named the scheme, though she'd never have heard of it, and then Lindsay <coughs> narrowed her eyes a bit. You in a juvenile lodge, Graham, or a man's? She was smiling. She'd found out her, his name from someone, and now she was guessing how old he was, but she was teasing as well and that nerve was still too raw for Graham to take courage. So he shook his head. I'm not. Bad enough he was in a band, that's what his mum said. There'd be no end of nagging if he joined a lodge. But Graham wasn't about to go into all that because Lindsay had her cool eyes on him, like she was weighing him up. She leaned in a bit closer. Me either. My dad's orange enough for the two of us. Lindsay pulled at her T-shirt tugging the lodge number onto her shoulder to show him and then shoving it back again out of sight. The knot at her waist had gone slack, so she undid it and then retied it, tighter, higher up under her ribs, and she told him, I've never been to Glasgow. Is it good there? Graham shrugged, trying not to look at her skin, that strip of it on show again above her skirt. I? He'd never thought if Glasgow was good or not, he couldn't say. Lindsay looked at him a second or two. Better than here. She wasn't asking, but Graham shrugged again by way of reply, not wanting to put this place down, because he'd had a fine time. Except that made Lindsay smile, so he had to look away, and then his eyes landed on the pale scrunch of cloth between her fingers. Lindsay laughed. She said, bet it is, and then, I've never been anywhere. She stood up and pocketed her knickers, and Graham thought she was making to go, and so this was it now. It was all over. But when he looked up, she was waiting for him. Are you coming? So, Lindsay gets pregnant. 
Graham gets fetches her back to Ireland, to Glasgow, sorry, from Ireland, and um, and they have a, a wee boy called Stevie, and for a while things go well, um, and during the good years Graham doesn't go to the band, but then um, uh, for one reason or another you'll have to buy the novel when I've finished it. <laughs> <laughs> um, things start going badly, and um, um, Lindsay basically starts scratching away at. at um, Graham's family sores, and um, and then he starts going back to the band again. And I'm going to read a bit from from when he starts taking, and much against Lindsay's wishes, he goes to the band, and he also starts taking Stevie with him. And I'm just going to read a bit from a band practice uh, when Stevie is seven. They never used to shout, Stevie's mum and dad, not when he was wee. Now he was seven, and they did it all the time behind closed doors, sending him out if he came in the room but Stevie still heard them through the walls. Most often they shouted about the band. His dad had been in it before Stevie was born, and now his mum yelled about him going to practice again. Stevie's dad went on Sunday nights. Sometimes the shouting started at lunch. If his mum got angry enough, she'd slam the doors, run down the close and off down the road. Stevie watched her go then, from the window in his bedroom, her red head bright against the tenements. His hair was the same as his mum's, everybody said so. So if she turned, he knew she'd see him, and he wanted her to do that. Their flat was a top floor, and he could watch her all the way down the hill until she made the corner. She never looked back, but he knew where she was headed. He went through the rooms then, looking for his dad. One time Stevie found him on the sofa, white-faced and quiet. His dad asked, She gone to your grand's eye? And Stevie nodded. His dad was his, his grand was his dad's mum. She lived on the far side of the scheme, and she said her door was always open. Stevie's dad said, I know whose side she's on, but not his. He sat with his fists on his knees. Then he held his big hands up to hide his face, and Stevie didn't know where to put himself. He wished his mum had taken him with her. He didn't know why she'd left him with his dad. His dad told him, she reckons I'll have to stay home now. Sometimes he did. He ran Stevie his bath and put him to bed. Warm enough, pal? I get to sleep then. But sometimes Stevie's dad made their tea early and then they'd head off across the scheme, the opposite way to his mum. Stevie knew they were headed to practice. He got to like it there, in amongst the men, even if it made his mum shout, even if they could be merciless some nights, taking the piss out of Stevie's tiny bones and how his dad was big and thick. They made jokes that Stevie didn't get, but he knew his dad should, about how Stevie looked like his mum, a dead spit, and there was none of his dad in him. They reached up and rapped at the side of his dad's head if he was slow to laugh. Emdy there, nor lights his on, but they patted his cheeks that had gone all flushed. Um, his dad wasn't quick with words. Sorry, I've abridged slightly. His dad wasn't quick with words, but Stevie knew he was good on the drum, better than anyone on the scheme. He was always glad when Shug got to his dad to kick the practice off, with part of a drum salute maybe, to get them all going his right stick knocking while the roll was kept up with his left. Stevie's dad had never done a salute, full salute for the band yet. That took near on five minutes, and he told Stevie he had to get it perfect first. It was the parts where he had to pick up a different beat that were the hardest, and on Sundays when they didn't go to practice, Stevie's dad worked on them at home in the evenings, while Stevie's mum wasn't there to hear it. Stevie listened to him then from his bed, going over and over the same change on his drum pads, stopping and going to the fridge, getting himself a fresh can before he worked on the next. Stevie liked it best when his dad knocked with both ends of the sticks, turning his hands over and back, over and back, so fast and still keeping time. That was his dad's showpiece, and if Shug didn't get him to kick off a practice night with that, someone in the band would call for it more often than not. His dad's heels lifted as he rocked, marching on the spot, keeping the rhythm, his chin and chest going out and back like a pigeon's, but no one laughed. The band were all hushed, mindful of the skill. They all stared at his dad's hands, wrapped, while the sticks flew and tapped and his big face went soft and blank, like it was just him there and his drum. Stevie loved the music, the serious faces while the men played and the thick foam his dad let him slurp off his black pint after. They usually stayed for one, and Stevie's dad said he wasn't to tell his mum. Stevie never did. That why, wasn't why she stopped him going. He told her something else he shouldn't have about a practice night. It was August, 
the 12th, just over a month back, and half the band were not long home from their holidays. So spirits were high and attendance was near on full that night, and the hall got hot with all those bodies. The first half was done and the doors were open, fags were being lit and trips being made to the bogs. Shug had gone straight through to the bar, I should say Shug is the bandmaster. No alcohol was allowed until practice was over, but playing was thirsty work, so he always poured pints of water and diluting orange at the break. But Shug was ages about the half-time juice, and it was usually him that nagged about getting back to practice. He came back through from the bar with no glasses, just an edgy look about him. His face was shining. Most of the men were sweating, but Shug's face was different. Gone all tight, and his body too, like he might slap you if your playing wasn't up to the mark. Everyone noticed the change, because no one moaned about being parched. They all just got on with playing Derry's Walls, like Shug told them. The half circle of, circle of flutes had their backs to the door, and the drums were facing them, just like always. Stevie was on the end of that line, so he could see. So he was the first to see the door open, and the man who came in to watch them. Jeans and blue t-shirt and balaclava. He walked into the big space between band and bar, and then he stood wide-legged, head down, his hands folded, respectful. God bless the hands that both broke the boom and saved the apprentice boys. Come the end of the third verse, most in the band had seen him. They were glancing over shoulders and missing notes, but Shug made them finish before he told them. We have an honoured guest. He's far from home and cannot return, but his cause is just, so let's make him welcome. Shug ordered hands across the water, and there was a fair bit of shuffling before they started, but they did well, and the guest raised a hand when they got to the end, nodding his thanks. He never spoke, and he never took off the hood, but he listened all the way through the second half, sitting on one of the long benches at the wall, his arms spread out along the seat back, <coughs> rock still save a tapping finger. Stevie could see the hairs on Shug's forearms all on end, and the slow tide of sweat running down his back, uh, his neck. Doug and Harry were next along, both with wide, damp patches spreading downwards from their collars. The half-circle of faces in front of Stevie was slick. The men were blinging the, blinking the stinging salt out of their eyes, but no one missed a beat to push at their slipping glasses. At ten o'clock, Shug ordered the flutes to stand on the chairs and the drums to surround them. They stood that, like that in silence, heads high for the stranger, and then they played the sash for a full fifteen minutes and longer. Who was that, Dad? It was chilly outside when they finished and Stevie's dad pulled on his jacket over his shoulders, but he didn't answer. Who was he? Stevie had to drop, trot next to him up the long wind of the hill towards home. His dad always walked fast when he was annoyed, and Stevie knew the question annoyed him, but it seemed worth knowing, so... Dad? I didn't know his fucking name, son, okay? That was all he got. So Stevie asked his mum the next day when she fetched him home from school. He told her about the stranger while, it, while they were climbing the stairs, and his mum stopped still on the second floor landing after she'd heard him out. She took a breath. Tell me, what was he wearing again, this man? Her eyes had gone sharp and dark, and then Stevie thought he'd got the word wrong. It was a strange word, and maybe it wasn't called a balaclava at all. He said, a hood, with eye holes, but a black one. Bloody hell, she muttered it, pulling Stevie back down the stairs, down the road to his grands. He wasn't to ask more, Stevie knew that. Some of the questions that we have been getting at a lot of events is, you know, what is Britain? What have we found out about Britain through our sort of literary exploration of it? And um, what strikes me about your story is that it, it's it's taken a very complicated or a very complex sort of political tension that also becomes personal. And I feel like you've really, I don't know, opened it up for me. I I, I, f I find I found that you know the the sort of Protestant and Catholic and the subdivisions, I found that a little bit rough to get my head around, but coming, but coming, through, um, but coming through a family narrative, it, it seems to break it open in a, in a very human way. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about the sort of choices to, one, write a deeply political story, but, and, and, but twin it with, with a very tender kind of domestic tale. Um, I don't know where the character, the, well the character's the key. Strange disembodied voice. He has a question. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have questions later. <laughs> um, I, think, 
think, well, I had to do quite a lot of research, but I already knew, I already knew that Stevie, Stevie was somehow there. I lived in Glasgow for eight years, and um, I had this idea about this boy, um, and, um, and maybe a dad that was maybe a drummer. That was sort of there. But then I had to do lots of research, and I had to get in touch with the Grand Lodge of Scotland, and, um, and go along to band practices, and talk to people who'd been in bands, and so on and so forth. And that takes a couple of years to kind of, to, yeah, to really sort of, get this really out of my comfort zone, this kind of thing. But is it out of their comfort zone too, or was it very hard to kind of... No, it wasn't, and it wasn't actually. Hmm. I mean, uh, you know, if you scratch scratch a working class Rangers fan in Glasgow, and you, you'll find your way to the Orange Order. And so through friends, you know, through friends, I got their friends, you know, who were, who were um, and most of them were kind of ex-Orangemen or ex-Bandsmen. So they didn't mind talking, but the Grand Lodge were actually surprisingly, I thought, accommodating. But they were very keen to have a different relationship with um, with the media or people who have access to the media. Mm. And um, you know, they've got a real reputation for being quite chippy, <laughs> and uh, and they want to. I think they've seen basically how the nationalist community in Ireland has re really been well served by um, having good relations with the media. And, and they want they want a bit of that, um, uh, and so. But that, anyway, that takes a couple of years to sort of really, and, and I also had to get to grips with the history much more. I mean, I, you know, I had my sort of O level um, history, but then I had to really, really engage with it properly again. And so I wrote. You know, I kind of had to write. I feel I had to write up my research, and so I wrote conversations between maybe characters about, <laughs> you know, the issues which are you know awful to read, but it's a way of. It's not at all interesting fiction, but it's a way of me getting the, the issues clear in my head. Mm -hmm. But then it can't be it can't be a book about issues; it has to be a book about people. So then it ended up being back to Stevie and what what might how might he have started, and then that the chapter that I read where Graham and Lindsay find each other in Ireland that was sort of, you know came very early in sort of writing of the fiction. But did you feel that? Because um, I mean, writing children is always interesting. I, a writing teacher told me once that if you write a child, they have to be old enough, to, but to sort of be able to express more complex thoughts, and they have to be incredibly observant and very mm -hmm. sharp. Mm -hmm. But of course, the, I mean, there's so much more to a child's, or what? What does a child's perspective open up for you as a writer? Well, for this book, I mean, this book is is really about Stevie. It's about the boy. The first chapter is him at 19, and the second chapter is what I read his conception. And then, over the course of the, over the course of the book, he can, kind of catches up with himself. Mm -hmm. um, but the, I'm, you know, I think he was very useful in the early, you know, when he's a child, when he's a real child, child. He was very useful because I'm writing about a community um, that people, most of my readers, will probably not feel very um, attractive to, <laughs> or will not be immediately au fait with, and will not immediately find them. Uh, particularly appealing, mm. and then um, a kid loves kids. I've got kids. Kids love you. Your kids will love you. <laughs> Doesn't matter what you do. Up to up until a certain age, they just think you're great. You know, they smile when you come in the room, and um, I, you know, it it's brought out. It was it made me be able to see Graham or show Graham and Lindsay. There's not so much of a problem with her, I think, but Graham, particularly in Graham's family. Um, as human beings, as gran, as mum, as dad, not as meathead in an orange band. Mm. So, I think he was he was very useful for that. I think he is very useful for readers. There's, there's also, I mean, I think the way you kind of write around the big issues and, and leave these wonderful silences, like the connection between Graham and Lindsay comes through a sort of set of, and correct me if I'm wrong, kind of acknowledgement of um, like symbols that they mm -hmm. recognize as belonging to a similar kind of tribe. And, I don't know, they, they seem to come together through silences. Mm -hmm. um, and is it because the symbols are so potent? I mean, the symbols are really potent in your story. The hood, the orange, the red hand. I mean, these things are kind of they're stark imagery. Mm -hmm. um, what do they kind of... Are they meant to kind of unlock things for the reader or, or just for the characters? Well, I think both. I mean, Stevie in the first chapter, he turns up for a, to do a job, 
uh, you know, on a building site or in a house, they're doing like a house, and he turns up with a red hand patch on his jeans. So he, and you know, in in Glasgow, if you wear a red hand, then you are identified with part of the, the Protestant side of the city. Um, uh, but then, you know, the red hand also is what Lindsay wears. You know, for the reader, then in the second chapter, the red hand is also what Lindsay wears, and Lindsay is, you know, she she's iconoclastic. She turns it around on her back, and um, you know. And it's and it's what is associated with this sexy, lovely possibility for Graham. So already, you know, immediately the the symbols are sort of being a bit lodged loose, dislodged, shall we say, mm -hmm. from uh, from just the political. Um, and you know that carries on a bit throughout. But I think you know Graham and Lindsay. They you know they recognise that they are. Well, Lindsay recognises that Graham is part of this tribe, but she's not. He's not quite like that. You know, she sees. She you know that. The softness in him is what she sees, mm -hmm. and then she you know he is. Or maybe I can get out of here through him. When our editor came down from so our editor John Freeman went up to Leeds to do an event on football and identity, and he described it as a kind of coming together of, of sets of tribes um, that were rallying around Leeds and, and football and um, indeed theatre because uh, Anthony Clavain's Promised Land is being turned into um, a, a theatre play about uh, Leeds, the football team up there, mm -hmm. whose name? Which name Leeds is United. It? Leeds United, thank you. <laughs> and he came down saying, this is, this is uh, yes, there's something about tribes and, and Britain. Um, is that? Are, are, are Brits tribal? I don't know, I think about like, you know, the punk movement and mm. the class structures, like, is, is it something inherently British that's kind of splintering into to loyal, sort of supportive groups? I don't know, I mean, it's certainly something in Glasgow um, that, that split, or the split along those lines. So, you know, the two football teams in Glasgow, Celtic and Rangers, are very much associated with Celtic with Catholics and Rangers with Protestants. Um, I don't know, the kids I teach at a primary school in Lewisham, I teach part time, I write part time, teach part time, or work, I don't know, I'm not a teacher. Um, I work with children with uh, behavioural issues. And they, uh, you know, already at that age, the older, you know, the juniors, key stage two, they know, they, they are in little gangs. Yeah. yeah. And or the older kids in the gangs use them as little messengers. So rather than British, is it perhaps just fundamentally human to, to want to question? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's about, I think it's it's very powerful to want to belong to something. So for Graham, what he, his, um, his drumming, he's not very good at, at, at much, but he's very good at drumming and he gets acknowledgement. Because even though there's that moment where, you know, that Stevie feels a bit like he wishes his father had a better way with words, yes, he could yeah. have a snappy comeback and maybe assert his dominance in that way, there's a very clear moment of power when he's exquisite at the drum. So. Yeah. And that's, you know, he, he really gets, he's, they want him back, you know, they know his, his quality and they want him back and when, when uh, Lindsay is making life difficult, then there's this other thing that's saying, you're great. <laughs> And that's, don't we all want that? We all want that, don't we? Mm. It's, it's a very powerful thing to be good at something, I think, mean, and to get acknowledgement for that. Shall we open, up the, open it up to the floor? Does anybody want to throw out an idea or two or ask any questions that haven't been unanswered? I know a lot of our audience members around the UK have you know, wanted us to talk more specifically about Britain, perhaps in a more prescriptive way. Is there, is there any... Any questions for Rachel? Um, sure. Stripe, stripe it off. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to ask, having spent time in a community researching that community quite thoroughly, do you then feel nervous about how they might receive the finished story? Do you feel like a responsibility for how they're portrayed in the story? Um, I don't know about responsibility. I have to be very clear with you, Sam. But you don't have a responsibility. But you have to be clear with them as well. Um, from the start, that you're not, you know, I'm not here to write something that's going to explain your and Georgia to everybody and make it acceptable. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
but I'm not also, I'm not also, I'm not out to, you know, it's not a hatchet job on your own charges by any means, you know, it's not, it's a, it's a story about family. Um, but I, yes, no, I, I'm nervous about it because, um, because not everything I'm going to say is nice and I got to like some of them, <laughs> put bluntly. And one of them said to me, um, he was, you know, he was told that he had to speak to me by the Grand Master. And uh, he said, I've spoken to people like you before, and, you know, journalists. And, <laughs> and, uh, and you always stabbed us in the back. And, uh, you know, that's not, you know, it's not a very nice way to start a conversation when you sort of think this person is worried about what I'm going to say. But, yeah, so... I don't, I, but I don't, I don't have a responsibility towards them. I think I have to be very clear to myself. Oh yes. I was just going to ask how long it took you from conception, or perhaps just the first germ of the idea. Is it, is it coming out next year, or? I haven't finished it. Okay. <laughs> I just wondered if you're working, if your publisher have given you a deadline, or if you've said yes, it's coming, it's coming, or. Um, no, I I'm somebody who doesn't like working to working under contract. Okay. So I, uh, you know. So it takes as long as it takes it for takes you. It takes as long as it takes. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Which is um, hard financially. Wow. And I made the decision. You see, I I wrote one one of my books. I wrote under contract, and that was I really did not enjoy that experience at all. Uh -huh. And then I was offered in 2008. I was offered a contract, and I said no. It's all right. Thank you. <laughs> Brain. system went <laughs> oh, no. a really bad decision. Uh. <laughs> but um but you know I, I still think it's better you know I still haven't gone out and said I would like and it's actually been very interesting experience but you know John Freeman um I've been in touch with the, the editor of Grant on and off because I'm one of their I just realized that actually it's 2000 next year you're going to have another best of young British and I'm not going to be young British anymore oh no Submissions out at the moment. It's open until September, so um, agents and publishers submit. <laughs> All of you. <laughs> Note to self. <laughs> Note to self. Anyway, please. I was so, going to ask you about the sort of yeah. yeah so it, I've been in touch with him about um, you know every so often you get asked, have you got something that might fit with these themes? This is always themed and things, and uh, um, because I've been working on this for ages and no um, theme has fitted so far, although horror was one that we thought about maybe, but um, but there's also something a bit cherry of, of giving out something that's in progress, but actually it's been a really brilliant experience to read it, read parts of it or talk to people and get their reactions and it, it's like um, Yuka described it, it's Yuka from Branton, she described it as like a mass edit <laughs> <laughs> and, it is, and it's, um, it's actually been really energising. Oh yeah? I thought, I, oh God, I might now just not be able to write it for a while, but actually I've been writing mm -hmm. it. What about reactions in sort of Glasgow and, and Belfast? I mean, those were your... You, did, you were in Glasgow on Monday? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, well, last, last week. Last week, Monday. Yeah. And um, on the 10th you were in Belfast. Mm -hmm. did those, how did those audiences receive it? Did they receive it in a surprising way or expected? Or? Um, I think they were, they were just... They have a, they have a sort of... A familiarity with it, which means that you can have—I don't know—you can have a conversation that doesn't isn't explanatory. Mm. <laughs> so, um, so that in that way, that's very interesting, I think. Mm. But, but you know, it, it's not just for people in Belfast and Glasgow, mm. you know. So it's it has to work for everybody. Sure. And um, but I, the one the you know I what I did a reading a long time ago because I studied at Glasgow University and. Um, my um, PhD supervisor, he asked me to, to read, uh, and so I did, and I read a ch a chap the, the chapter about um, Lindsay and Graham meeting on the Orange Walk, and um, it was at the point where I thought, I'm going to move that from the end to the beginning of the book, because you have to know about Graham's inner life and his inner softness really early on in the book, it was really important, and then I read it out, and, and I, you know, and I love Graham, really, I think he's such a great guy, <laughs> and um, and then I looked up after I finished reading, and there was this woman. Oh, no, actually, as I was reading, just you know, the bit where they sleep, and um, and there was this woman in the front room. 
And so I thought I've really managed to communicate his, you know, inner beauty. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming. We're um, coming up to the tail end of our uh, conference of events. They, I guess they end on mm, June 20, no, well, July 10th at the London Literature Festival. We have a whole, oh God, you'll, you'll be there, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, and then also in Norwich. So, I don't know. Um, <laughs> no one's going to come to the Norwich one having heard that previous. <laughs> <laughs> no, I might go. The, I, the author is coming. Yeah, so I'm really looking forward to, um, to having him. Brilliant. But anyway, um, granted.com backslash events is where you can find what we get up to. And this and dance parties themed to Pakistani music for the Pakistan issue. And art gallery openings and um, your classic literary panels is... It's what we do to bring literature into the world. Um, <laughs> so I hope to see you guys again. And uh, there's more. There's a bunch more red wine. I don't. I didn't bring any extra wine, so I'll pour you some wine. Thank, thank you. you for coming. Thank you.